everybody for coming. Uh, I this is one of my favorite subjects. I my my first camera was a Pentax Spotmatic that my brother gave me in 1963, and one of the first things I bought for my camera was a set of extension tubes from Spiritone. For those of you old enough to remember, Spiritone was a a photo outfit in New York City. I think I paid five dollars for a set of brass extension tubes that were nothing but tubes. No, well, there wasn't any electronics in those days. So that's what got me hooked. So let me introduce you to uh, photo macrography, as the purists call it. I throw in a little mind mapping just for fun. And uh, I've color coded the Vogon poetry for those of you who want to run out of the room when I start that. So what I'd, what I'd like to talk about is some of the equipment, techniques, inspiration that you might need to get started in the close-up world. Um, I'm trying to keep it from being a boring talk about equipment and f-stops and all that, so I hope I've succeeded. This is uh, the mind map that I put together over a couple of weeks time to, to think about all, all the things that um, go into a, a good uh, knowledge of macro photography. So you don't have to study that. I, I promise I'll, I'll send um, a PDF of this to Steve so I can put it on the website. Uh, a little bit of boring stuff. The pure is called macro when it's one-to-one, -one, that is the, the object is exactly the same size on the sensor as it is in the real world. Uh, in the world confuses close-ups and, and macro, and I'm not a purist when it comes to that. So this, you know, let's talk about close-up photography. I, I have a tendency to, to do things in the one-to-one -one and, and two-to-one, and if I could, five-to-one range just because I love looking at things up close. Okay, here's the Vogon poetry. As I, I think I've shown this before, the laws of physics are not kind to us. So depth of field in uh, macro gets really, really, really thin. Uh, down the bottom you see if you're if you're on a full frame sensor at F16 at one to one, the depth of field is one fifth of a millimeter not very much. When you get out to maybe a foot away, it's, it's a quarter of an inch. So depth of field is really small. So that's one of the things that kills you. And uh, if, if anybody ever wants to hear about focus stacking, I can talk about that some other time, but I'm, I'm not gonna talk about that tonight. All right, the, the big thing in, in, in the equipment world are if you can afford a macro lens, it makes things a lot easier, but it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, forget the camera part. Lighting, to me, lighting is one of the more important things in that my own personal opinion is, is flat lighting works better than uh, really sharp, pointy lighting. Tripods are real handy if you want to do things like focus stacking. Tripods are handy for shaky old people like me just because if your depth of field is a fraction of a millimeter, I can't stand that um, still. So I tend to take a whole lot of pictures and just throw away the bad ones. Ancillary stuff are things like uh, the, the mundane, like knee pads. Roy Allen did a, did a great show for us about flower photography and concentrated on the smart things like knee pads and drop cloths. Um, the other Im important ancillary equipment is uh, diffusers and what have you. Okay, in the in the macro lens department, there are macro lenses from 15 millimeters up to 200 millimeters or thereabouts. The, the longish macro lenses are good for insects, butterflies, uh, what have you, just simply because you're far enough away not to spook them. Uh, although I, I started with a with 180 millimeter Sigma that I bought from Chris Chase mm, 10 plus years ago, maybe 15 years ago, and got all sorts of service out of that. And then I switched over to a, a Nikon 105, and that's kind of my go-to lens now. 
but I, I read recently, heard recently that one of the off-brand third third world thing uh, um, brands called Laowa now makes a hundred millimeter lens that does two to one. If you're interested in that sort of thing, if you're lucky enough to have a Canon camera, uh, Canon has a fantastic uh, 65 millimeter lens that does everything from one to one to five to one. Um, the shorter the focal length, it makes it more difficult to use in that there's uh, less space between the front of the lens and the subject. So you'll spook living subjects and it's harder to light subjects when the camera gets in the way. Okay, if you don't have a macro lens, go out and buy a set of extension tubes. Uh, Kinko is a brand that I use, but there, there are other ones now that are probably just as good. The, the purpose of, a, of a, an extension tube is to simply move the lens farther away from the sensor. The farther the lens is away from the sensor, the higher the magnification. Um, the main thing you have to be careful of is that they transmit the electronic signals between the camera and the lens, that is things like the, the uh, aperture control. Uh, I noticed a few days ago, I put my entire set of three tubes on between my 105 and my camera, and there was enough wiggle in the, the three extension tube stack that the uh, aperture information wasn't being transmitted back and forth, so I couldn't use the three stacks. So I just used uh, two of the three. Okay. I hope this is inspiration, less Vogon poetry, and uh, less talking about details. I mean, it's, this is just an example that I like to show. Uh, remember the field trip to Descanso Gardens. I was fascinated by these conical shaped flowers. So I pulled out the 105 and put it on a fairly wide open aperture to get a blurry background. So uh, this one has really nice bokeh in the background, but notice that there's a kind of an un uninteresting other plant in the background, simply because I wasn't looking at the background. So uh, one of the things I learned from Hutch a while back was one of the most important parts of macro photography is to l choose your backgrounds carefully. You can get into trouble in a hurry simply because if you're using a small aperture, you have more in focus in the background than, than you think. And if you have a hot spot, it can really be ugly. So you have to really, really check your backgrounds as you're uh, taking, making an image. So I think I probably at the time noticed the pink thing in the background and moved. So I moved over to one side and moved a little closer. And voila, no ugly background. And now just by virtue of getting in closer, the, the flowers are a more prominent part of the picture, which is really what I wanted to be prominent anyway. And the, the curved doodads, whatever those are called, I don't have a real good biology education since I hated it. But this picture is pretty good, but I think it maybe needs a little bit more. So uh, I stole this from someone else I heard on the, on the internet, bringing raw files to life. So part of what macro post-processing consists of you know, the obvious things like making sure the exposure is right, tweak the contrast as needed, color in either overall color or just color temperature, whether that be color temperature or color uh, tint. And uh, to, to emphasize your own point of view. So I, oh, a little bit more. So first thing you do is go in and make sure you've got the, the right color temperature. Often, uh, I find myself shooting in open shade, so that tends to, uh, to give you a much cooler light. I use open shade simply because it's uh, flatter light. You don't get harsh shadows you like to do with, with sunlight. Uh, exposure consists of you know, setting the, the black and white point so you get optimum contrast, and then you know, pull, pull, the, pull the highlights down as needed or pull the shadows off as needed. Maybe you can throw in a curves adjustment to uh, increase the uh, mid-tone contrast. Okay, yeah, let's go in the, in the, 
personal interpretation arena. You know, let's get rid of things like sensor dust spots. Uh, lots of people have noticed that I'm not very good at cleaning my sensor. So I'm, often someone says, where'd that dust spot come from? So it's one of the things. And, and if you all remember Dan Holmes talking about digital pruning as opposed to uh, actual pruning out in the field, you can do things like optimizing the, the composition by either cropping in a little closer or rotating images. Uh, I showed someone one of my favorite flower pictures a couple of years ago, and the first thing she did was grab it, cropped it in 50%, rotated it, and suddenly it looked much, much better. Um, think about emphasizing elements like using the you know, the brushes or especially the radial filter. You can throw a radial filter on and vignette the, 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 the background and make it uh, less uh, obtrusive, perhaps a graduated filter if you've got a, a hot sky or a, a warmer sky. And then uh, my favorite tools, clarity and texture. I think uh, I'm having an affair with clarity these days. So, took the, the previous image and uh, lowered the uh, white balance down to compensate for the, the, the cold blue sky that it was shot under. And I didn't fool with any of the others except for the whites and the blacks. That gave it a little bit more contrast. And then you can see I added some clarity. And uh, here's a, whoops, I was going to talk about that. Wait a minute. Oh well, I had a I had a before and after. All right, now let's talk some technical stuff. If you're still awake, lighting boils down to whether you're going to use uh, existing light, sunlight, or whether you're going to use flash. And I talked a little bit about uh, background. If you don't have a good clean background, perhaps you have a, a, a multicolored cloth or different colored uh, cards or black velvet, uh, white fabric. If anybody remembers my uh, two pencil shot from last month in the macro competition, the orange and black background was a multicolored fleece sock that was a foot away and, and completely out of focus. Um, in the light modifier arena, uh, you can either, I especially, especially when I'm out in, in the sunshine, I use a diffuser almost all the time. One of the typical circular diffusers that uh, you can buy at B&H or Sammy's or wherever. Uh, a light tent is handy if you're doing something inside. Uh, reflectors are handy if you're in uh, an area where you need to to bounce some light up into a into a subject um, i also in in the past a little bit more so than than today use my macro light macro electronic flash that i'll talk a little bit about later um, other things to think about in a more in a artistic sense is think about whether you want to backlight a subject or front light a subject. If, if anybody follows Deborah Saturko, she's uh, picked up some interesting uh, ideas about backlighting flowers, which is, is a really fascinating subject that I haven't been able to figure out yet. Okay, so lighting, you can either use thermonuclear fusion, also referred to as the sun. So it's cheap, it's harsh, um, it's often said that uh, the smaller the source, the sharper the shadow. So the sun is a long ways away and is a very small object. So you tend to have very harsh shadows. Uh, I'll, I'll skip the Bogon poetry about solid angles. So this is why if you're outside, you almost have to have a diffuser to make the light um, flatter. Okay, on the other side, with an electronic flash, they're especially helpful. Uh, On-camera electronic flash with a typical flash is a little bit difficult because the, 
the flash tends to be at um, less than optimum angle. Sometimes if you're really up close, you can get a shadow from the front of your lens onto your subject. So a lot of people go out of their way to make um, unusual diffusers to put in front of their, their big speed lights. So uh, if anybody's interested in that, give me a yell and I can, I can tell you about it. In my opinion, the, uh, the, the nice thing about a dedicated macro flash is it puts the source very much closer to the subject. So you'll have a, a flash that's, you know, a couple of, you know, an inch by three inches or thereabouts, but it's only three or four inches away. So it's, um, it looks much bigger to the subject. That is, it subtends a larger solid angle. I had to throw in a little bogon poetry there. Okay, macro flash. Canon makes one, um, Nikon makes one. Uh, the one on the, on the right is what I have of, macro what's it called an r1 c1 but it's the you see the two devices next to the lens are small electronic flashes and the advantage you get with the electronic flash is you can be out in the wind and if your subject is moving the flash will stop the action same thing for uh, bugs although again it's very difficult to shoot moving things at, at high magnification Someone else, I don't know who it is, also makes an LED macro light that's very similar to this, much less expensive. These, these macro flashes are really awfully expensive unless you do an awful lot of macro work. Okay, modifiers. Okay, we talked a little bit about uh, sunlight. I, I even built a, a diffuser for my dedicated macro flash that I think really helped. Um, and, and for those of you who like to go to the Huntington Gardens, whenever you go, don't ever tell them that you have a diffuser because they, they suddenly think that you're a professional photographer. So uh, B&H and, and others sell uh, translucent white umbrellas that you can use for a diffuser. Make, makes a great tool for, for the Huntington when it opens up in July. Just a, a little bit of uh, an example on the left you have straight harsh sunlight and on the on the right you have sunlight plus a diffuser it, it didn't help the background any the background's still awfully busy and not so pretty and uh, it's not such a beautiful subject but it was a something in the backyard that i could take a picture of so if you're outside i think you need a diffuser all right let's stop talking technical and See if I can talk some inspiration again. All right. You can think about macro as either a very realistic image or an abstract image. When I first started doing this 10, 12, 15 years ago, I was really big into taking extremely realistic scientific illustrations of flowers. That was kind of my thing. It's a it's, it's a long story not to get into in, in this meeting, but uh, I really enjoyed realistic things. But as I've gotten a little bit older and thinking differently, I also enjoy finding close-up images that are more in the abstract world. And I have a couple of those. So think about in the, in the composition world, you can think about Perhaps there are ways you can use shallow depth of field to throw the background way out of focus, or you can use deeper depth of field to capture all of the elements of your subject. Uh, I was working on a, a bud of a zinnia out on the, the balcony today, earlier in the day today, and I was using F8 and F16 and realized I didn't have quite enough depth of field for either an abstract or a realistic picture. So it's back to the, back to the uh, drawing board tomorrow. Uh, think about the, the color combinations. That is, um, make sure you have complementary colors in your, your background. So for example, this morning I was shooting a, a greenish zinnia bud that and I happen to have some purple flowers in the background. So it looked, looked interesting together. Um, think about soft light. I've, I've said soft light a whole bunch of times. All right, let's go. Okay. Do, 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 do. 
uh, repeat of what I said before, you have to be really careful about your background, move around to change the perspective. Sometimes you can move an inch or two and change your background completely. Um, or you can superimpose your subject over some suitable background object that may be five feet away. Or the, the other thing you could do, if you have a flash, you can use flash on the subject and then the background will tend to go very dark simply because of the, the fall off of, of light. So I actually have a real example of that. The, uh, the one on the left with the greenish, beautiful creamy background was taken with uh, natural open shade in my backyard. That's a, one of my favorite succulents. And then I said, okay, well, what happens if I put the, the flash on? So the flash shot appears to me to be a little bit sharper simply because it's uh, not as diffuse as the, as the other light. And you'll notice that the background has gone completely dark because the background was probably 10, 15 feet away. So the, the flash exposure that was appropriate for the plant was, uh, way too dark for the background. All right, so now I'm going to treat you to less talk about equipment and more talk about things that might inspire you. This is large portion of these are, are down in uh, Wildwood Park over the years. This is a skipper that I saw flitting around on a tree that was, uh, or a bush that was so and since I took this one with a 180 millimeter lens, so I was able to, to get a ways away. And then when he would sit there and be quiet, I could slowly move in a little closer and closer. So this is a kind of the culmination of a series of pictures that started out with a barely recognizable butterfly in the picture down to something that's fairly well recognizable. And this is Again, the advantage of using a full frame camera. This is a crop of probably a quarter of the frame and it's in reasonably good focus. The tips of the wings are slightly out of focus and the, the, uh, the right most uh, antler, is that the right word? Slightly out of focus. One of, one of my favorites, this is a, a, a really esoteric shot setup. I took a, an enlarger lens of 50 millimeter or 35 millimeter in larger lens and put it on a bellows, which is a device for kind of like an old fashioned extension tube and was wandering around my backyard trying to take some abstract photographs of this orange cactus that uh, was in the backyard. And at the same time, this little uh, green beetle, maybe it's a stink bug, flew into the picture and paraded around for me. And the, the yellow dust on there is, is uh, particles of pollen. So this is one of my favorite photos from many years ago. Uh, Larry White and I were wandering around the San Diego Botanic Garden a couple of three years ago. And this is uh, the beginnings of a banana tree leaf that was about to unfurl itself. So uh, again, getting in really close and it, it almost becomes an abstract object. And again, the, the background goes way out of focus and, and it isn't distracting. What's a little distracting here is the fact that the, the, the brown tendril is out of focus, but I couldn't do much about that. Although I did sharpen it up a little bit in Topaz Sharpen, but I think I didn't pick the one that was sharpened. Uh, another of my favorite subjects, the uh, wild cucumbers grow down in Wildwood Park on the Moon Ridge Trail. And uh, I've got hundreds of photos of these. The background here maybe could have been a little bit better. The, the bright spots are, are a little bit hot. This was a natural light photo, not, not with electronic flash. When I, when I used electronic flash, the background went almost too dark. This was um, a foot and a half outside my back door, the house on 
Palencia Circle, I walked out one day and saw some little white something that I could that I actually couldn't even resolve with my eyes. And this is about a one to one exposure with the with the 180 millimeter macro. And you can see the texture in these are insect eggs. And if you look at the uh, kind of the top, you see the, the little black triangle and the little red things. Uh, I watch this every day for, I can't remember how long. And this is, uh, I can't remember if I said, this is roughly one to one exposure. So that, that green stem that's passing through is a few millimeters in diameter. The, the eggs are probably the size of BBs or a little bit bigger. And then a few weeks later, they all hatched and they're, uh, I think they're called shield bugs. They may also be stink bugs. I'm not sure. So it was really fascinating to look at these through the lens. I, I couldn't tell what it was when I looked at it with the naked eye, but uh, got the lens out and here it is. So got these little guys crawling all over the place. Another, another day I was out um, on the, which trail was this? Can't remember now, I'm up in Wildwood Park. Linmere Trail, the one that, that parallels the extension of Jan's Road. And I was shooting down into the, the tendril of a wild cucumber, planning to make a focus stack. My, my intention was to have all of this in focus. And then I looked more carefully and uh, this was a tick. So that tick had to be maybe two or three millimeters from head to toe. And uh, this is, this is one of the images where I made, this was before Photoshop invented content aware fill. I had to clone out a piece of black chain link fence that was, that the uh, spiral was growing on. But this, this is one of my favorites. I love, love this image. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was bored inside uh, with the uh, coronavirus lockdown and pulled out this acorn that I picked up when we were up in Yosemite a couple of years ago. And this is a focus stack. The, the, the acorn is probably at least an inch from top to bottom, maybe a little bit more. And this is a, an image stack of about 25 or 30 images taken a, a fraction of a millimeter apart and then stacked in a, a piece of software that stacks images together and throws away the out of focus stuff and keeps the the in focus stuff and if anybody is ever interested in the future you can yell at me and i can give you a private lesson on that but it, but again i just love love the textures that you can that's what fascinates me to, about macro uh, this is a tiny little uh, cactus that i had in my backyard a few years ago the bloom is maybe a half inch across. And this is a single exposure at, at whatever the exposure was, F, single exposure at F5.6. And then I stacked 40 some frames together to get it all in focus. And I don't know, I guess the botanist in me loves the sharply focused picture. You can see the, the, the spines on the cactus are all in perfect focus. So. That's how I waste my time. I was following Hutch around at uh, one of our field trips, a trip we took down south to the uh, Botanic Garden. And, you know, with a, with a little bit of uh, post-processing, this might turn into an interesting abstract. It was some bark peeling on a tree. Uh, when Larry and I were down in the Botanic Garden, it's, just, uh, it's the backside of a a palm tree. Perhaps if you know if you know if I rotated it and cropped it a little bit differently, it would be even more more abstract than it is. Or maybe convert it to black and white to get just the, the stark contrast. Uh, if anybody remembers, uh, maybe a year or so ago, Alex uh, made it just a fascinating abstract of a decayed cactus, a opuntia beaver tail cactus. It was just the uh, 
the inside and converted it to black and white. Found it just just fascinating. Uh, water patterns, probably on the beach, or it may have may have been a creek bed somewhere. Can't remember now. Either either one. That's a you're going to have a wonderful time if you go down to the beach and catch the the sand patterns where the where the water has, has made channels. This one's uh, looking at a flower over at uh, Descanso Gardens, getting up really up close and personal with the, uh, I can't remember what those parts are called either, pistols, anthers, stamens. But the, uh, the right side's kind of ugly looking with all that uh, pollen and I left a left an ugly thing up in the left-hand corner. So you can see this, this could stand a little work. And this was, this was one of my favorite adventures. This, if anybody remembers, I entered either this picture or one of its uh, brothers in competition when uh, Diane Racy was judging for us. And Diane is a phenomenal PSA S4C judge, but I titled it Monument Valley trying to be cute. And she didn't see Monument Valley in there and didn't see much value to the image. Uh, Dan Holmes, who's a little bit more of a naturalist, didn't understand what it was. But this is a, this is a rotting oak tree that had fallen over down in uh, Wildwood Park. And these are called medullary rays. These are the elements that radiate from the inside of a tree to the outside that um, carry fluid back and forth in the tree from the inside to the outside or the outside or which. But this is a focus stack of uh, 30 or 40 ground is thrown way out of focus because it's an inch or so behind the, the scene. But this, this is my bit of uh, Zen meditation. I discovered this tree one day and I spent two hours wandering around this tree taking pictures. So that's the, the therapeutic effect of macro photography for me. Okay, uh, let's see. I think some of you might remember the, the red image that I, I guess it was last month's entry, the, this one with. Uh, the, once again, the parts that I can't remember, the pistol stamen thingamajigs. So this is what the final image looked like. This was approximately two to one magnification. And again, this is a focus stack of about 25 images to get it in complete focus from, from front to back. But this is what the, the setup looked like. Uh, Natalie has somehow in her infinite uh, kindness, forgiven me for co-opting the dining room table for the last three weeks. But as you can see, I have the, the 105 macro and two extension tubes and the electronic flash from the front and the electronic flash you see way over on the, the left-hand side of the, the picture. I don't know if, no, I can't use the cursor. Way over on the left-hand side, about a third of the way up the frame is, is another electronic flash illuminating from the background. So there's a little bit of trans illumination as well as front illumination. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I actually put a big diffuser between the flash and the flower to pull this off. And the other interesting thing I discovered recently on Amazon is a little weighted device that I think was originally designed for people who do either jewelry making or soldering small things, but it's a device with a couple of alligator clips and it can move in any direction, up and down, left, right, etc. So I use that frequently to, to position subjects. And the yellow thing in the background is to cover up the ugliness to make this a slightly better looking picture. Not very good. All right, one final look at this. And maybe getting close to the end. Let's 